Good afternoon and good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Colin Mahan, and I'm a program manager at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. For those of you who may not know, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit dedicated to enabling entrepreneurs from all over the world to realize their maximum potentials and grow. As you may have seen in the chat, the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center, along with our partner Mentor Cloud, launched a free mentor matching platform for entrepreneurs called Mentor Makers. Create your own advisory board to guide and inspire you with in-the-moment mentorship from topic experts and professionals dedicated to providing exceptional mentorship to entrepreneurs across all races, industries, and geographies. Together, we will build the greatest exchange of knowledge and expertise and service to entrepreneurs and business today. Find and become a mentor today by using the link that we've provided in the chat. Entrepreneurs are the dreamers, doers, visionaries, who are not just solving the problems our community and world face today, but that will create a better future for us all. Mentorship matters to all entrepreneurs. Their success is dependent on it. Quick housekeeping item, we're gonna open up for live Q&A at the end of the event. So please submit your questions to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation. Again, none of what we do could be possible without all the amazing support from our sponsors, including NASDAQ, Lehigh University, Bank of the West, KPMG, Wilson Sonsini, Woodruff Sawyer, BPM, NZTE, and Microsoft for Startups. We are humbled by their contributions. Now, before we get started during these unique times, we're curious on how sentiment is among the entrepreneurs we work with. So we're gonna start by taking a poll to let us know how you're feeling about your business right now, as well as what's keeping you up at night. What are some of the offerings that we could be providing to you as entrepreneurs out there in the ecosystem that will help your business? So that poll is live. So we would appreciate if you let us know how you're doing and what are some of the topics that you'd like to learn from over the coming months. All right, the responses are coming in. Appreciate you guys. I'm going to give this another second or two, but it looks like we've got a couple of winners. So I'm going to share those results. Looks like optimism's at the top of the key, which is good. Starting off 2021 on a somewhat optimistic note. And um, what's keeping you up at night? Finance. Well, you guys are all in the right place considering the topic of our discussion today. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing. Apologies there. Um, without any further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our special guest today. We've got Moni, who's the co-founder and CEO of AMSI. We've got Flossie, who's the co-founder and COO of AMSI. We've got JJ, who's CFP Relationship Director of Military Affairs at USAA. And we've got Abby, Supplier Diversity Program Manager 
at Amazon. So welcome, guys. What's up, Colin? Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Happy to have you. Good morning. Thanks for having us. All right, well, we're gonna jump right in, if you don't mind. So uh, first question up for Moni. Your journey as a founder is immensely interesting and will lead us to sharing more about the risks and successes you have achieved in securing funding and growing 100X, congratulations, by the way, in your first year. At this moment, please share with us the beginning of your journey. How did you begin as a founder and what inspired you to take the leap? This is a really great question. And Flossie and I get this question all the time, obviously, because we've had such great success. Um, for me personally, I started like every other military spouse having to hit the restart button every time we move because of our military member, you know, having to transition from base to base and um, having to start at the bottom everywhere we went. So for both of us, I know we took the leap because we couldn't find the resources out there at the time to support us in our entrepreneurial journey. And um, Flossie and I both were working for organizations that specifically helped uh, military spouses and were we were working and advocating for them already. Um, but what we found was that there were no specific resources for entrepreneurs. And that's something that Flossie and I struggled with in building our other businesses. We were always Googling and just kind of trying to figure it out. And um, that's what led us to really take the leap and start the Association of Military Spouse Entrepreneurs. We really wanted to just provide a place um, that was very tailored for military spouses. Amazing. Um, and it's very important work. So thank you for what you're doing. What mindsets did you adopt during your early journey that you think our attendees and founders need to be to adopt to be successful in the times that we're in right now? Um, the number one is don't be afraid to fail. Um, for us, uh, we bootstrapped this thing. We had we started with no funding. We started with an idea. We started with a passion, and we started from um, coming from a place of experience of, of needs that we wish we had. So we put ourselves out there. We didn't know if it was going to work uh, because we are a super niche community. We had no money, like I said, and but but we listened to our community, and there were those needs out there. So don't be afraid to go with your gut is another one that Flossie and I say all the time, whether it's um, community partnerships, um, sponsors, any type of and anybody that you bring into your circle, just don't be afraid to go with your gut. Always, you know, make sure that's at the forefront. Super helpful um, as entrepreneurs are scrappy and hopefully go with their guts. <laughs> um, up next, Flossie, you co-founded MZ and started it as a scrappy and innovative labor of love. Um, when you launched this venture, what was most important to you at the time? Um, for us, what was most important was not reinventing the wheel. So because we had already worked in the space in the military spouse space and the military space is kind of tight, we wanted to make sure that we collaborated with as many partners as possible. So we, we said, we're just two people. We can't possibly do all of this by ourselves. So the first thing that we wanted to do was go out and find as many partners as possible and just bring them to our military spouse community. We knew that we could aggregate all of these incredible military spouses into one location, but we needed to bring them the best possible resources and the best possible partners. So we wanted to bring in people like USAA and people like Amazon and said, hey, you have these great resources and these great programs. So we wanna collaborate and we want you to bring the best of the best to our military spouses. But on behalf of the military spouse community, we wanted to be the voice to say, they have these specific sets of needs and this is what they're looking for. So we were kind of a, a pipeline to the military spouse community. So it was really important to us to be the voice and to, to be a trustworthy organization that um, not only can companies come to to find military spouses, but be a representative of the military spouse entrepreneur. Super helpful. Partnerships are key in the early days. Um, takes a village, as they say. Um, Moni, MC is one of the first spouse engagement orgs in the nation. Um, what have been some of your big challenges that you and Flossie have ch uh, faced as entrepreneurs and founders? And can you share some of the big risks you've taken and how you over overcome some of those early challenges? Yes. Yeah, so one of the biggest challenges is that we're not a nonprofit organization in our space. A lot of organizations are 
they want to support nonprofit and they want to support profit, but the funding is mostly there for nonprofit organizations. So one of our biggest challenges has been kind of proving that we are a social impact organization and we're here, our mission is to support the military families and we do that by supporting military spouses. Um, so we are living and breathing military spouse entrepreneurs, which is why being a for-profit organization is really important to us that we're leading from the front, um, that we are a little guy in a small space and some organizations have millions of dollars and we started this program with 10,000 less than $10,000 and we just want to say like hey we're doing it we're going to continue to advocate even though we are a for-profit organization and um, keep hearing listening to our spouses and bringing them resources that we need. Amazing and speaking of supporters we have a couple of them on our call today. JJ what excited and or inspired you to help fund MZ. And can you share oh, yeah. how, Sure. And can you share how they're uniquely positioned for success from your perspective? Yeah, thanks, Colin. Are, are you not listening to them? They're, they're pretty dynamic. <laughs> 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 no. Well, one of my themes as I, as I, as I was thinking about this uh, before coming on was just the idea of alignment. And, and so I think that's a critical thing as you're looking at uh, potential opportunities out there for funding is, is that from, from our perspective at USA, we, we want to, to work with folks that are aligned with our mission. And, and our mission happens to be, or the first sentence of our mission is to facilitate the financial security of our members. And, and so you've got military families all out there. And, and one of the big challenges that military families face is that spouses are being uprooted on a regular basis and maybe an irregular basis. And so employment is, is typically an area where they're underemployed or unemployed. And so what better way to, uh, to, to, to really take that ball into your own hands and, and start your own business? And it's not for everybody, but it is an area where folks need help if they're gonna do it. And that's what Flossie and Moni and AMC really offer is the ability to, to lend them that helping hand. And if I tie it back to that whole mission statement at USAA, financial security, facilitating our members' financial security, I really can't think of anything that uh, helps facilitate financial financial security, like uh, an extra paycheck, if you will. Paycheck's probably not a good word for this audience, but, but uh, additional income. And so we really found a fit there in terms of what they're doing that's going to be great for them, but really great for the broader community. So uh, beyond their shining light that they provide individually, just the idea that there's really a good fit there between our mission and what they do. Amazing. Look, I can't agree more that their energy is contagious. Um, Abby, same question to you. What, what excited and inspired you to fund AMZ? And can you share how um, you're aligned from your perspective with them? Yeah, I just want to say too that Amazon, we made the decision to fund AMZ before USAA. So, hey. Jeez. Um. <laughs> now, we're, we're going to talk about the process and how you get there and, and what have you. So, maybe there'll be some more nuggets to learn as we go through this. Yeah, JJ brought up a good point on alignment. So I worked with Flossie uh, before she started AMZ. Uh, I created the military entrepreneurship program at Amazon with the intention of launching sellers on Amazon with product-based businesses who are either military spouses or military veterans. Um, and obviously Flossie and Moni, they're so connected to the spouse community. Their network is very large and growing and uh, they're very dynamic, as you know. And because they um, were so resourceful and I knew that they could deliver results and that at Amazon, that's huge. If you can deliver results, I'm gonna trust you as a partner, right? So we created the goal and uh, we launched some storefronts on Amazon that featured spouses and veteran businesses. And um, it, it's, it was a great, it's been a great partnership. So that was very much in alignment with what we were trying to achieve. And we believe in the work that they're doing. Amazing. All right, well, this one's for our entrepreneurs in the audience today that I am very, I'm sure are very curious on how they unlock those partnerships with both of you, JJ and Abby. Um, so we'll start with Boney, but I still want, I want to hear with, from your perspective on this one, Flossie, too. Uh, what are some of the secrets on how to present to potential funders? What data story helped you rise above the crowd in the conversation with our good friends, JJ and Abby? We'll start with you, Moni. Absolutely. And I'll say for me, um, well, and for both of us, relationships are 
one of the most important things. We didn't just roll up and start this and, you know, just land all these things without curating um, these relationships. Um, you know, Abby and JJ and other um, people at USAA, I've known them for a long time and Flossie and I have, you know, um, been in this space for a long time and we have crossed paths many times. And, you know, when we launched this, I, I knew I, I had to reach out to USAA because Mike had been one of my biggest advocates and um, um, it just takes me back. I'm sorry, I get a little, like, I'm just thinking about it. It makes me a little emotional because when I crossed paths five years ago, I never thought you guys would be such an integral part of what we're doing at AMSI. And it just means so much to us. So people always ask us like, what, how did you get this sponsorship? How did you get these uh, relationships? It's been um over time. It's been over time. It's been showing up. It's been supporting what they're doing and their endeavors and things that they're going through and just showing up for your community every day. And I don't think, I think that that showing up Flossie and I all the time, I think that they've seen that. And um, when we presented and we reached them, reached out to them and pitched them, they were like, yeah, how can we help you? And, you know, we sent them our deck and they were like, hey, let's get on a call. This is what we can do. And, and um, we move forward from there. So, you know, I will say the number one thing is the relationships over time. It doesn't happen right away. I mean, some of it can, you know what I mean, which is great. But these types of relationships are around for longevity and um, we intend to continue to grow them to make a greater imp impact in the lives of military spouses. Amazing. Yeah, relationships are key in this day and age. Flossie, um, when you were all on Zoom nowadays, and so I'm sure your partnership discussions have been in a similar environment that we're all in right now. Uh, what are some of the tips and tricks uh, other than maintaining the relationships that you guys are fortunate enough to have with JJ and Abby? Um, what are some of the tips and tricks for pitching on Zoom? Uh, what are some of the materials for our audience that you have found to be helpful, not helpful? Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, so that's also that's my job at AMC and LinkedIn is my, my biggest tool. Um, so my profile on LinkedIn is filled out. Um, I post on LinkedIn consistently about who I am and what I do, who I advocate for about my work. Um, I reach out on LinkedIn. I, I go after relationships of, of people at companies that I know that can support my mission and I message them and I say, hi, I'm Flossie. I'm the co-founder of the Association of Military Spouse Entrepreneurs. And I lead with the question of saying, what do you do to support military spouse entrepreneurs? And usually that leads to a conversation of, well, you know what? We either do X, Y, and Z, or you know what? We don't do anything. And that's an interesting conversation that leads to, let me direct you to so-and-so, or I love what you're doing. Let's lead to this meeting or this email or this person. Um, but it's a special type of work that we do. Not many people will say, I don't want to support military spouse entrepreneurs for starting their own business to create economic impact for their families. It's, it's a special type of work that everybody wants to support. Um, so I, I reach out on LinkedIn and I'm very um, true in my passions of what I want to do. I want to help military spouses and I want them to be better and I want them to bring dollars into their pockets so to help their families and that's the mission at the end of the day so I get those meetings and but I have tools I have um I have decks and I have packets that back up the work that I do um our organization's founded in data which is what um our organizations like USAA and and Amazon especially love so we collect data on all the work that we do um, and it helps further impact other organizations and what they're doing to build more programming for our, our military spouses. What, you know, everything that we do, how many master classes do we have? How many members do we have? Um, how many people are attending? What's the demographic data? How much revenue are they generating? We want to know as much information about the people that we serve as possible. So not only can we continue to serve them better, but our partners can serve them better. And then other organizations can build bigger and better programs because we were the little guys. We are the little guys and we're gonna to continue to grow to be bigger guys and hopefully the bigger guys can build bigger, better programs. So build your tools, build your toolkit, get to know your audience better, but use data, um, use relationships, use your LinkedIn, reach out, say hi, um, but come prepared and know your industry. So, um, but come with a smile and uh, stay persistent. For every 10 LinkedIn messages, I get two that respond, and then I might get one meeting. 
but then I send 10 more. So uh, those are those are my tools. And uh, I just I, I keep at it. And uh, I've built some amazing relationships with great people. Amazing. Yeah, persistence is key. And you touched base on a point that I think would be valuable to our founders out there in the community. When presenting data, I'm sure we've all seen the PowerPoint slide that has things that you can't read or 20 pie charts. Um, so what's the best way of conveying your impact revenue numbers, whatever you're trying to convey to your funders? And maybe JJ, I'll kick it over to you on what's important to you, but what's your best, what's your best advice for people putting together decks on how much to include, what to include? Anything there? Do you want me to take that or, or yeah, JJ? Flossie, yeah. I mean, you were yeah, just talking so about it. For us, it's storytelling. What's your story? And and data is just, a, it's numbers to tell a story. And you have to know what story you're trying to tell. Um, but we knew the day that we started AMC that we couldn't do that without data. There wasn't enough data about military spouse entrepreneurs. Um, and I knew I couldn't tell the story to other organizations and other companies without that data, that I couldn't prove that they were struggling. I couldn't prove that there wasn't enough programming without that data. And I couldn't prove they weren't making enough money that they didn't have enough skill set without that data. So with that data, I can say, look, this is what's actually going on. This is their need. So use your data to tell your story and it just, it gives it validity. Um, and then it helps you pivot too. We've learned about our audience to say, this is where we need to improve. And then maybe these are the things they don't need. And then with COVID, we were the first virtual organization and we were serving uh, virtual education and virtual resources. Now everybody does that. So how have we learned to grow, grow and continue to be um, at the forefront to serve and uh, continue to serve our, our customers and clients and our members, um, but be relevant and make sure they're not getting zoomed out. So we have to use our data to continue to pivot as well to make sure that we're serving them in a way that's relevant. Super helpful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, JJ, I'm sure you and Abby's inboxes are inundated with decks and people trying to get meetings with you. Um, what's a tip? Maybe JJ, I'll start with you and then go over to you, Abby. What's a tip on the first approach? Um, I guess the first line of communications, if you don't have a relationship with the person, what's the best way to um, get in touch with folks like you? Do you want me to go, Colin? Yeah. So, so I think, I, so I put the uh, kind of the portals in, uh, in the chat box. So if you want to, whether it's a sponsor, market ship sponsoring request or a charitable request, we have a couple of portals that you can go into. But I was going to say that uh, don't have the expectation that uh, that that first interaction is going to be the thing where you hit the home run and it's all good. And, and I was thinking about Moni, and, and I don't even remember what it was, Moni, but you mentioned that 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 we've seen you around, we've had this relationship, and that's very true. But I, but I also remember, and I don't remember what the what the, what it was, but there was something you pitched that, that you were working on years ago. And, and frankly, I don't remember what it was, but it wasn't a fit. And so it wasn't something that we took uh, to any additional level, but we continued to, to, to see you guys out there. And, and when this came up, it, 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 it was a fit, it was perfect. And, and so then I'll shift to the data part because the data has to be, and, and, and these guys know this better than anybody because they do a fantastic job of it. The data has to be relevant and aligned with what, with what you want that funder or what you know that that funder is trying to accomplish. And so in this particular case, for us, it's financial security for spouses and how that can make a difference if they're able to, to really start and launch a business, how that can really change families' lives. And that uh, allows us one, to, to feel like, hey, this is a good fit. But two, we don't exist in a vacuum. And we, ha we, we have to tell the story as we allocate money out and justify the, the use of that money. And so you really help us tell the story by presenting that data that's really relevant to, to really our mission. So it's, it's a great, and, and you guys done a great job at that. So thank you. Amazing, thanks for sharing. Abby, over to you. What's some tips to uh, help reduce the friction on the first interaction when people are reaching out to you? Yeah, and, and you're right. We get flooded at Amazon. <laughs> um, I, I think, uh, you know, both LinkedIn and, and email and, and all that, I think what's helpful is if someone comes 
forward saying, hey, this is what I can offer you through my company first, rather than with the ask, um, because you tend to kind of tune that out and you're like, okay, you know, just another person asking for something from Amazon. But if they can say, hey, I, this is what my company can provide Amazon and, and support it with some type of data, and then maybe point out a commonality that, you know, something we may have in common, right? Um, I think that helps build its a little bit easier it's a more palatable uh, because i will admit you know we have so much going on that there are a lot of requests that we just can't answer and you know obviously when it came to flossy and moni we had already had that relationship which helped and i was very selective in how who i chose to fund i only chose four primary partners for my program um you know and i i really think Amazon will never fund someone if we can't work toward a problem and if we can't solve a problem together and you can't support it with data. So it, we're, we're very much not about just writing a check. It has to be something we, we can create together and, and we can solve together. Amazing. Super helpful advice. And hopefully your inboxes will hurt a little bit less if anybody tries to email you on this call. <laughs> um, well, speaking of funding, uh, Moni, what types of funding have you decided to take on? And also, do you find that funders that are aligned with your values is uh, really important? Um, and where are you at there? So to answer the second part of that, yes, values are very important to us. Um, so AMC has taken on grants. Um, we've also taken on corporate partnerships as well as several streams of revenue to fund our program. Um, we're not a one size fits all model right now. Um, so we have different types of partnerships and cor corporate partnerships and other sponsorships. We, um, we initially started to raise a seed round last year and then we decided it wasn't the right fit for us at that time. Um, so we just continued to grow organically. Um, quarter two is in the works. We are purposely, we have purposely sought out partners by leading with questions like what, what are you doing to support military spouses, which is what Flossie was talking about earlier. And, you know, we've just been really blessed to be able to get all kinds of fundings like grants and, and the partnerships that Abby and, and JJ have provided. We would really wouldn't be where we are without them. So we are, you know, we take a little bit of everything right now because we're such a small company. Amazing. Yeah. Well, it, just as long as it keeps the, the engine running, right? Yeah. You know, it's, you know, as a, a startup, you have to, you know, you, you know, take a sponsorship from this, a partnership that can bring in something that will benefit your community. Um, sometimes grants are, are the way to go. So, you know, for us, it's about continuing to improve the program. Everything that comes in goes back right back into the association and it goes back into our team because we also have a team. So it just goes right back into building, you know, economic stability for our military spouse, military spouses and their families. Amazing. And Flossie, I'm sure you've been right next to Moni on this fundraising journey. Um, what are some of the surprising avenues for funding that you guys uncovered that would be helpful that you may not, because again, you guys started looking for a seed round from institutional investors, right? And ended up going in other avenues. So what are some of the other avenues that our entrepreneurs who are hopefully trying to look for some capital in this day and age um, that you found to be helpful? Yeah, for us, I mean, this seed round, it's kind of hard because as a, a for-profit corporation, um, you kind of feel pressured sometimes when you're growing and you're growing rapidly, rapidly and you need funding, you, you kind of get pushed into that venture capital route. Um, and we were kind of that way last year. And then once we stopped and paused, we realized that venture is not really right for us and we can continue to grow without it. And we wanted to control our organization and the path that we were on. Um, and we could continue to grow currently without it. So um, we just wanted to make note that sometimes it's not right for you and it's okay to say that, um, that uh, we just took a good look and said maybe later, but our, luckily because of our partners and grant opportunities because of the work that we do, even as a for-profit um, with some nonprofit partners that we have uh, is leading us to stay funded and stay in growth phase and continue to grow our program, um, but also still diversify with multiple streams of revenue as well. So making sure that we can continue to grow and be financially responsible and have great mentorship as well on the financial front, making sure we're forecasting and um, continue to make sure our numbers are strong and our community is strong to make sure our program continues to grow um, at a good pace as well. 
So um, there's grant opportunities as, even as for-profits um, and you can continue to do great things and have multiple streams of income. So um, we've definitely been surprised uh, by the way that we've grown and it's not the same thing that we thought when we started it and it's not gonna be the same thing we're doing in three months, I'm sure, but uh, entrepreneur pivot and that's the, that's the name of the game, right? So you gotta stay nimble and continue to, to figure it out on the way, right? Build the plane and and you know, leap and build the plane on the way down with a whole bunch of people on the back. <laughs> That's where we're at. Amazing. And I mean, you brought up a couple things that we're actually involved together. One is partnerships, um, our partnership with, and, and you also mentioned mentorship as being really key. Mm -hmm. uh, so our partnership on mentor makers has been great. So uh, as we shared in the chat, check that out if you guys are looking to mentor and or um, get some mentorship. We've got a free program called Mentor Makers on our website that we're partnering with Amazon. So that one's great. JJ and Abby, we spoke to the uh, initial approach. Um, curious if you have any uh, learnings, insights, or takeaways for whilst in conversation, what helps um, move them quicker? I know in this day and age, now that we're all on Zoom, uh, that things take a little bit more time and everyone's a little zoomed out. So what's some advice like after they get into contact and after they're in the meeting with you, what's a winning way to help reduce friction on the partnership discussions? JJ, we'll start with you. Okay. Yeah. So, so I think the, the key thing in there is, is, is you've got your agenda and you've got uh, things that you want to accomplish, but it, it really, it's just the idea of listening. So listening to what, what it is that we're saying and what it is that we're trying to accomplish, because we, we're, we're very specific in terms of what we're looking for from a, from a partnership. And, and yeah, maybe down into, hey, here's the deliverables that we expect uh, based on this sponsorship. But but again, it may be it may not be directly down in the writing. You you have to listen to the the nonverbal cues, if you will. And, and so with AMC, again, based on everything we've talked about today, that the, the fit was so perfect for us because it's an area that we think makes a difference. It, it helps facilitate our mission, but. Uh, they, they've also done a fantastic job of, of dotting the I's. And, and so I think the way you can dot the I's in a way that, that I need them is, is to listen to what I'm both saying directly and indirectly. So not just firing a deck into your inbox without asking you any questions first? <laughs> yeah, do that battlefield intel, right? So figure, figure out uh, with us uh, on, the, on the corporate responsibility or corporate citizenship side. I mean, you can go on the, the website and figure out, okay, here are the pillars. Here's what we're trying to accomplish. So if you're going to go that route, then, then whatever you send in ought to reflect that. Uh, otherwise, uh, for, for Moni and uh, Flossie, they've known us because we, as they said, we, we've interacted with them for years. So they kind of had a sense of, okay, how are we going to push the button right? And, and, and of course, leave it to them to do it right. So that's good. Amazing. Thank you, JJ. Abby, over to you. What's some way, whilst in the conversation, to help, um, uh, I guess, make the conversation move faster if the partnership's aligned? What, what are some of the things that um, help you? unlock partnerships quicker. I'm very transparent with everyone I talk to from the beginning. I'm not going to give them any false promises. And I can usually tell within 20 minutes if it's something that would align with what we're trying to achieve at Amazon. And if it's not specific to my team or my program, then I likely know someone else at Amazon who may be interested in the company or the nonprofit, right? So I am I used to negotiate. My, my whole career has been mostly negotiating. So uh, I'm just very honest and upfront with them in the beginning. You know, like I said, Amazon doesn't just write a check to anyone. It has to be something that we can solve together. And, um, and Flossie and Moni, they, they've been able to deliver those results. And we had that relationship before for. So uh, yeah, but if it's something innovative, that strikes my, my interest and you can sh support that again with, with some type of data or proven performance, then yeah, I'm, I'm going to be interested. I think that's a great point though, Abby, that, that Abby made about regarding the idea that uh, the connection. So maybe it isn't Abby that you end up working with. Maybe it's somebody else in her organization, but, it, but um, and my boss is great at this. Uh, Mike Kelly, he, he's kind of a, I call him a connect the dot types guy, connect the dots type of guy. So you may go to come to us and that we may be your first stop and, 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 but it ends up, we end up being a funnel to, to put you in contact with somebody where it's a better fit. So, so don't, don't be surprised if that's what comes out of the conversations or the, the effort. 
Amazing. Uh, super helpful. All right, Moni and Flossie, you're first time founders and you guys have had an amazing uh, spurt of growth. So um, to the funding question, I guess, since the finance is the number one thing that's on everyone's mind on this call, what, would, uh, what did you learn um, as a first time founder throughout your initial fundraising discussions that you wish you knew um, in the beginning days? What have you learned? Uh, Moni, we'll start with you. Or Flossie, you unmuted first, so I'll go with you. <laughs> I just wanted to say to you, we're not first-time founders. We're both serial entrepreneurs. Oh, so, okay. uh, <laughs> we're first-time founders on this together, but we both have owned our own ventures before. Um, so this has been uh, an interesting journey together um, because I I would never, my first company, I, I was a I owned it on my own and I had some great scalability in my first company um, and it was exhausting and tiring. But now that I have a co-founder, I, I don't, I'll never start another company without a co-founder because having somebody to lean on, first of all, um, has been crucial actually in the success of what we've done because it's, it's not just like it's a two for one deal because um, I needed somebody like I have grit and ingenuity and like, uh, having somebody with all these skills and talents, but Moni has grit and ingenuity and passion and skills and talents, but having somebody who works as hard as you do uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week with as much passion um, towards what you're working towards, it makes all the difference in the world um, on those days when you're exhausted or tired, you have somebody to pick up and vice versa. Um, so uh, yeah, so I just wanted to throw that in there, <laughs> but I, I, I missed the question. So if you wanna, I was distracted, I apologize. <laughs> I, I, missed, I missed the question the too, I need the I need the question again. <laughs> oh, what, uh, what are some of the lessons learned fundraising um, in your first venture, not AMZ, <laughs> apologize for that misconception, <laughs> um, that you, you wish you knew now? Well, yeah, so I one of the things I was going to say is, um, as far as, uh, raising fun, like fundraising, like pitching yourself, that was a whole new world to me that I really had to learn and study a lot of terminology and research what VCs are looking for and angel investors and understanding, um, that I'm giving away a piece of my company and like what all these different terms meant. So in that, I will say in that regard, I wish I would have kind of researched that before I started because there were some hard questions that were asked of me. And I said, well, I don't know that, you know, in all honesty, when you're just starting, you just don't know what you don't know, but it is a whole other world. And if you haven't started, um, you know, trying to get funding as far as like seed rounds or pre-seed rounds, um, do your research, really uh, listen to those podcasts, really download those acronyms, learn what they are and um, write those notes down. Cause that's something I wish I would have known before I started search looking for that kind of funding. And it was a learning experience. I'm really glad that we went through it. Every time we did it, we'd come back, we'd write our notes, what went good, what went bad, how can we make it better? Oh, this was a great feedback. Even if some of the feedback sometimes wasn't great what you wanted to hear, but you brought it to the table and said, wow, this is a really great point of view. Let's pivot and add this, or let's tweak our pitch deck or, you know, slow down when you speak. I tend to speak very fast, <laughs> you know, so little things like that, but just to really educate yourself on those, th for me, that's something I wish I would have known before that, before we started that process. Great. Yeah. And we have, we do have a lot of resources on our website and there are a wealth of podcasts and resources out there on how to get pretty quick up to speed on some of those acronyms, language, and just some of the vibes that those uh, institutional investors have. Um, JJ, what has inspired you to work with, uh, what's, what's set AMZ apart? What inspired you to work with them? And what has been some of your experience in the early days watching them grow? Well, if you can't tell that they're they're pretty pretty cool, they're pretty uh, dynamic and magnetic in terms of just their personalities. But but uh, where we started uh, the alignment, what what they're doing is uh, one. First of all, they're part of the community, as they told you their story. That they're they're part of the community, which is appealing to us, and that they're addressing a need in terms of income, 
for military spouses and the, addressing the challenge of military spouse employment in a different way that, that really fits. So, so I think the other thing that, that the word I've heard multiple times here in, in different uh, answers or different thoughts is, is persistence. Uh, they're, they're extremely persistent. And, and sometimes uh, from, from our perspective, uh, we, need, we need to be, be pushed a little bit because there, there are a lot of things going on and there are a lot of different requests coming in. And so Moni and Flossie are not hesitant to, to give us that kick when we uh, perhaps need it. So uh, I'd, I'd say that's really helped keep us on track. Super helpful. Persistence is key. Abby, over to you. What, sets, what set MC apart in the early days as you got in first before USAA? No offense, JJ. <laughs> yeah, I think the the uh, their network, the breadth of their network. We did a survey, I think, when way back when, and in one day we got like 600 survey responses, and that was a large enough sample size for us to move forward with what we were trying to build. Um, two, what also sets AMSI apart is their savvy on social media. They have a great social media presence, and they're very data-driven, and obviously at Amazon, we love that. So, um, and then every time we need we need something or they need something, it's just easy to ask. And, and I also wanted to bring up another point, Colin, I don't want to get off subject too much, but I forgot to say if you are looking for support from Amazon to be creative in your ask, because Amazon will uh, offer in-kind work such from everything from machine learning to data services to physical goods. It doesn't necessarily need to be money, uh, but be creative in your ask because that's often more palatable to Amazon than a check. So I forgot to bring that up earlier. That's a great point. And also, I love the idea of uh, you, be excited, you being excited about those creative, uh, so creative social media presence and everything being tied together from an organizational standpoint. So I think that helped our attendees on the call today. Um, we're going to hit Q&A in five minutes or so, but a couple more questions for you guys for the attendees. Um, as we all know, uh, company and companies in every industry are transforming as they navigate the disruptions brought on by this pandemic that we're all in. Um, so, Moni, I'll start with you. How have you guys transitioned and transformed over the past few months? And what are your advice to founders that are trying to innovate during this time? Um, you know, for us, we were already online, so we already had everything set up. Um, all of our courses were online, all of our master classes were online, all of our communication was already on, on Slack and we um, had already educated our team and our members on how to do that. Um, but as, as the pandemic came, we got hit with a lot of questions like, what do I do, what do I do? And we just, you know, we pivot, you, you swerve, you figure it out. And we just come together and say, well, how are we gonna reach more clients? How are you gonna take this from in-person to online? And that's when we reached into our toolbox and we brought out master classes and we reached out to national organizations and said hey can you teach us our spouses how to use this and how to do that and um the key is to continue to stay educating yourself and learning new tools to continue to stay with the times, right? So everybody's online. So you have to learn to pivot and the places you have to go are the places that are offering those resources for you to continue to drive your sales. Great. And JJ, over to you. Uh, USAA is a long standing organization. How did the pandemic impact you guys and how did you uh, overcome some of those challenges? <laughs> it didn't know. <laughs> it, it actually is, has been uh, interesting. I, I was actually at a military spouse event when we got called back. This was back in February and said, hey, that's no more face to face events. And so as part of an organization that uh, really are, are ambassadors for USA out there, if you ever go to an event and there's a USA guy in a, in, in a polo shirt or polo shirt or gal, it, it's from my team. And so we really had to overhaul the way we did business. And I think ultimately taking 35,000 employees uh, that, that were out uh, at the various offices we have, it, within a week, uh, we were down to, to less than a thousand that were still in those offices. So, so that was, to me, was a pretty neat transformation. But we also, we, we've, we've given back a, a billion dollars to our auto policy holders and auto dividends. 
Uh, we, we did a, a we're part of the military family relief initiative where $30 million in giving to, to support military families directly to organizations that help military families. So for me, it's been a great time to be a part of USA. It's been, it's been of course, difficult as it has for, for a lot of people, but it's also been a, a time where I think, uh, and this is when we tend to shine when things are going bad, when your car breaks down, when the, when the, the roof gets hit by hail, in this particular case, who would who would have guessed? But when we get hit by a global pandemic, I think USA has had a long history of shining and, and just like kind of like my head, and it's it's really come true these days. So, you beat that, Abby. You can't shine like that. Okay, Abby, we may have been uh, second. Amazon's on the lead of uh, the cutting edge of technology. Were you impacted at all, and how have you guys changed the way you work with founders? Oh yeah, obviously, uh, obviously Amazon was impacted, right? We had a we we have seen honestly a lot of the peak that never ends. We call it peak at Amazon when you know there's so much demand for goods um, that there's really no stop in the in the flow, right? So we've actually innovated to we we like JJ mentioned we used to go to events all the time and we moved to all virtual programming where we brought in recruiters uh, across the entire company and did that for free for the military community. Um, I'm seeing Amazon take a real uh, leadership role as well in mental health. Um, we've seen during this past year both Amazonians and within the community, the military community, uh, really struggling with, with mental health during COVID. And, you know, just two days ago, we launched an affinity group that's going to be focused on mental health for Amazon. So it's really great to see the company taking a leadership role. Um, and then obviously everything that happened with social justice and housing and HQ2, I mean, you know, we just move way too fast. So, um, you know, I think COVID has honestly been really good for the company in a, in a weird way. So. It's produced challenges that many have overcome and some aren't still over them, but still, um, I think in times of crisis, uh, a lot of really great companies get built. So hopefully everybody out there in the attendee land are working on some cool problems to help the rest of the world like uh, MZ and Moni and Flossie are working on. All right, I know it's time for Q&A, but I wanna end with a quick lightning round. So. I'm gonna go around, uh, I'm gonna go around the group. Moni, I'll start with you. When you look into the future, what do you see and how do we get there? You mean as far as the as association? Okay. Oh I yeah, see. we're not boiling the ocean on where society's going or the pandemic. <laughs> um, as far as the Association of Military Spouse Entrepreneurs, I see it on all military installations as a resource for military spouses to walk in and say, I just moved here and I'd like to start a business and they hand over an AMC deck and all the resources and all everything that they can attend and, and do. Um, all the resources out there to help military spouses build their businesses and for more organizations to join us collaboratively to continue to to build what we're doing. Um, we can't do this alone. So if you're interested in supporting us, join us. Love it. Speaking of decks, I'm sure Flossie has a big part in them. Uh, what do you see in the future? What do you, what does AMSI got on the horizon? Exactly what Moni said. When we started this, we said we want when a spouse walks into um, any resource center or Google's, you know, unemployment or I need a career or anything military spouse related that they had two options, not just how to find a job, but also, hey, I can start a business too, because that wasn't an option when we were looking, we never heard that you could also start a business. And I said, how come nobody told me this? Um, I wish people were yelling this a little bit louder. I would have did this a long time ago. I could be my own boss instead. Um, so we want entrepreneurship to be an option for military spouses everywhere and not only an option, but a viable and successful one. So that's what we're trying to do. Well said. JJ, over to you. What do you see uh, at USAA in the future? What are you looking forward to in 21? All right. So, so I'm going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to totally direct away from that question, Colin, okay. and uh, give uh, a shameless pitch to, to Moni and, and Flossie. The, the, what I see in the future is 
uh, every military spouse that uh, wants to start a business has a copy of the Military Spouse Entrepreneur Guide. So Stars and Stripes is actually publishing this that uh, Moni and Flossie put together. And uh, so no, it hasn't been mentioned yet, but I thought I'd, I'd tee that up for you guys to, to talk just real briefly about, because I think it's a, a neat opportunity to, for folks to get to a resource that can help them uh, you know, fill a need that's out there. So how about that, Colin? Is that all that right? Was great. And all right. a resource for the entrepreneurs in the audience right now. Abby, over to you. What do you see for 2021? Oh my God, I'm so excited for 2021. So when I first got to Amazon over two years ago, no one cared about military owned small businesses. And they were like, whatever, stop talking about this. And because of things like BLM, Amazon has so many great new initiatives now. And I'm on an exciting program where we're focused on small and diverse businesses. And see, we look at, you know, organizations like AMZ, where obviously there's a, an interest now, a genuine interest across the company to support. So I, I think the, the future looks really good for, for small businesses, which is something that Amazon is really passionate about. And I'm happy to be part of that conversation. Sounds like you share some of the optimism that our audience had in our poll earlier. So that's great. Um, okay, we're transitioning to Q&A, so there's a lot of great questions coming in. We'll try to get to all of them, but we may not be able to. Um, first one with, from Alyssa. What business traction, um, Moni or Flossy, feel free to take this one. Um, what business traction did you have before you were able to raise your first funding round? And that's either one of your organizations. What, or what traction do you suggest uh, our founders who are fundraising um, should have? So we haven't raised an official round, which would be a venture capital round. The only funding we raised at AMC is partnerships and um, grants and, and sponsorships. So um, we haven't raised an actual round and we raised um, money before we actually launched AMC. And we raised that um, specifically on our reputations and our previous um, companies. I was a seven figure founder, Moni's been a six figure founder. So our reputations on who we are as entrepreneurs and what we've done in the military space. Um, so we did that together. We said, this is our idea. This is who we are. These are the organizations we, we've worked for. Um, this is what we've done in the military space. And then this is what we plan to do. We really, we really laid out a well-written plan with uh, some hopes and prayers and said, together, this is what we can do. Um, and we brought on some great partners together. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. And yeah, I was, I was speaking to at least traction as far as not even institutional money, but all the other money, but super helpful what you shared. Uh, Abby, I think this one could be for you or JJ, but we'll start with you. What's the key to a successful pitch deck? Yeah, you know, believe it or not, at Amazon, we don't use PowerPoint. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, you know, don't send me a pitch deck. No, um, I'm, I, I, <laughs> I got to say, um, obviously, data is essential, right? And to me, that's, that's all I'm going to look at. You can don't give me a lot of verbiage, long winded sentences, just show me this is the impact I can make, or this is the impact I have made in, in numbers. That's the first thing that we're going to look for. Awesome. JJ. And I, I, yeah, so I'm looking at it from a military advocacy standpoint, which is, which is our perspective on my team. And to me, I would just say tailored. So tailored to, to what it is I need to hear. If you're blasting the same thing out to everybody, then that's probably not a good idea. Awesome. And uh, along those same lines, another question. Um, how detailed should the budget and business plan before having conversation with funders. They're saying, should we have a budget for one, three, or 10 years? Maybe any preference there? Yeah, I would say start off with, with one, right? Um, you know, we like to test things out here. And if, if it is a success after the first year, then we can have a longer term conversation, but everything is very fluid at Amazon. So it's, it's hard to commit to things long-term. So for me, I would say start with one. Awesome. JJ, any thoughts there? Really, that's kind of outside my spectrum in terms of uh, where, where I play. So, so I, I don't want to say something that's uh, off base. All good. Moving on. Um, Moni and Flossie, somebody's asking, how do you recommend seeking funding for something that has never been done before? That is such a good question because I consider ourselves kind of innovative and never being 
what we've done never been done before, especially in our space. Um, you know, to tell a story, like Flossie was saying earlier, it's really important to tell your story and then hit the pain points of why your product or your service is needed. What gap are you filling? Who are you serving? How is what you're doing gonna make somebody or something better? How are you going to um, change somebody's life? Um, how are you going to leave an impact longer than for 10 minutes, right? So storytelling, um, the numbers are important, you know, like we talked about today, the whole time, data, data, data is important. Do your research, do SWOT analysis, um, go to other companies that are maybe doing something similar and talk about those companies, but how what you're doing is, is a step higher, right? Or it's gonna leave a deeper, deep, deeper imprint in the world or in your community. And just to piggyback on that too, why you you and, and what makes you qualified to fill that need. Um, and if you're filling a gap, show how you're filling the, the gap. Like why is why has it not been done yet? That's the biggest thing. So if it hasn't been done, why? So just really prove why it hasn't been done and why you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And you guys are part of that community and you know a lot about it. One piece of advice that I typically hear and give to entrepreneurs is uh, you should be really immersed in your space and know a lot about the problem you're solving. Right? I'm not a tennis player and if I had a racket, you wouldn't buy it. Um, so <laughs> I always say that. All right, tons of questions. Mm, feel free to pass on this one, uh, Moni or Flossie, but curious if uh, somebody's asking, what are the limitations of using an LLC for profit? Um, that could be a lawyer question, which our good friends from Wilson Cincinnati, I'm sure, would be help happy to field. But um, why did you decide to go for profit? Uh, are you LLC C Corp and why not 501c3? We started as LLC and we transitioned last year to a C Corp uh, when we decided to start to raise the seed round. So we are officially a C Corp, um, but only because we transitioned for fundraising efforts and then due to our expansion and growth. But other than that, I can't answer to the limitations yeah. as far as fundraising. We host Wilson Cincinnati events all the time. So we'll cover all the details and the legal logistics there, but good to know that you guys went from LLC to C Corp. There is a longer answer for it, but um, sometimes it just makes money move faster. All right, tons of great questions. Um, Moni and Flossie, what are, somebody's asking, what are some good sources of funding for education programs? I would say to start in your local area, all, every state has grants. Um, so find out if you qualify for any of those grants, how you qualify for any of those grants. Um, so that would be number one. And then also don't be afraid to start asking questions in your local networks. That is a really great place. So many times you'll be surprised how much information your local network has, but if you don't ask, you don't know. Flossie agrees. Uh, another question for Abby, somebody's asking, does Amazon support startups outside of the States? And they're saying specifically Africa and Kenya. If it aligns with what we're doing, absolutely. Yeah, we have a global mindset in everything that we, we try to achieve here. That's what I had thought. So hopefully that's helpful. Whitney asks, there seem to be so many resources out there. How do we whittle them down and focus on the appropriate and applicable options? Flossie, any thoughts there? That's honestly why we started AMSI, um, because you will Google yourself to death otherwise. Um, we built custom curriculum here at AMSI called Building Your Business the AMSI Way because it's broken down into seven units and 65 modules because you, will, you have no idea where to start. And we wanted our spouses to come in and find step one and then step two and then step three. Um, I know it's really hard, but I would suggest finding a program or a mentor, um, something through your local SBDC or your Women's Business Center or your local SCORE chapter, and basically getting a plan together on what you need. Um, and that's what we did for our members, was that our members were drowning in the, I have no idea where to start. And Moni and I went to the School of Google and YouTube, and that's how we built our first businesses. And we didn't want our, our fellow military spouses to have to do that. We wanted to give them a very structured place to, to know how to build a business and to know what step one and two were. 
and if they needed any help, they could lean on their fellow military spouses who are also building businesses. So um, I just highly, highly suggest to find a mentor, find a local program, find a local support network and ask those places. Because um, otherwise Google is overwhelming. They, they have the world at their fingertips. Um, so find a program, find a support network. That's great advice. And I mean, community is important. Uh, even now more than ever, right? I, I hate to use that <laughs> overused term, but during the pandemic, people have, have been really hungry for community and connections and uh, support. So really appreciate that. All right, well, we're almost at the end of our time. So thank you, Moni, Flossie, JJ, and Abby for joining us today to share some of your insights, some of your tips, some of your tricks um, and setting such a great overview. Um, on behalf of everybody on the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center's team and myself and everyone in attendance today, we sincerely thank you for joining us. So um, it's been great to learn from you. It's been fun. For those of you still on the call, we've got some great webinars coming up in the next week or so. Um, so this Friday, tomorrow, we've got LinkedIn Marketing. So as, as Flossie was saying, that's one of her primary tools uh, with George Cow. He's going to sit, he's going to teach y'all how to effectively and authentically grow your business on LinkedIn. And then um, next Tuesday, hot off the press, we've got another webinar with our partners over at Wilson Sonsini, KPMG and Bank of the West on the second rollout of the PPP funding process. So if you're looking to understand the nuances of the new application and what all the implications are, join us then. And to everybody on the call and to again, to our wonderful panelists, Thank you all for joining us and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>